uh, turn to Second uh, Peter chapter one. We'll kick off from there again, and then we'll hit on some new ground. But Second Peter chapter one, we've been talking about life and godliness, and uh, specifically, we've been talking about uh, in these last several weeks. Now, I think this is our third week going into this uh, charity, and uh, so we'll get into all that in a moment. But first, I'm going to pray. And then we will, we will go further. Father, we love you and thank you for your blessings and your goodness to us. I do ask that you would help us as a church, help us as a nation, help us uh, uh, to, to get through whatever we're going through, Father, that you might be glorified by it. And uh, Father, there are many churches who are, um, who are struggling right now uh, and uh, under great threat. And uh, Father, I pray that you give them wisdom, give wisdom to the leadership and, and so forth, and the people, and the Father you protect. We love you, though. We thank you for all that you've done, all that you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we've been talking about this idea of life and godliness. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, going through this again, G uh, Peter is speaking. He says that he's a servant apostle of Jesus Christ. He's talking to those people who've obtained, they received a like Precious faith, and this faith is uh, that we have from God. It's of great value is what it means. Precious faith. I was reading uh, in Samuel. In fact, I'll be preaching from Samuel this morning. But I was reading in Samuel when Samuel uh, was was uh, receiving the call from God. And uh, the Bible says in that, in that phrase, in that passage, it says that there had been no... Uh, the word of God was precious in those days. And what that means by that is... They hadn't hardly heard anything from God in a long time. Eli, you know, he's, uh, he's on his way out. His sons are, are living wickedly and so forth. And so the word of God is precious, you know. Well, this faith that we've obtained from God is a precious faith. And uh, meaning it's, it's, it's unique. And uh, there's not a lot of it. Uh, in other words, uh, only those who get it from God have it. And, uh, and so it's, it's not just some common faith. But we attain this, the Bible says, through uh, in other words, no, no doing of our own. We obtain this through the righteousness of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ. And then he says we have this grace and peace, but it can be multiplied unto us also through the knowledge of God and our Jesus, our Lord. And then he says, according to his divine power, talking about God, he's given to us, and this is what we've been talking about these last several weeks, uh, everything, all things that pertain unto life and godliness. You want a, you want a life that ha is full of life? You want a life that's full of godliness? Well, this is how you do it. Okay, He's given us everything we need. If your life is in the doldrums, if your life is, ugh, if your life is, uh, uh, is wicked, if your life does not have the joy that it ought to have, if your step doesn't have the step that it ought to have, listen, I had, a, I had a, you know, an interesting morning this morning, and I was down in the dumps a little bit, but the truth of the matter is I've got much to be joyful over, much to rejoice over, we're going to kind of see that also in the next service, but uh, he says, I've given you everything, God's given you everything that pertains to life and godliness, and Jumping down to, to get past this uh, uh, introduction area, uh, we find in verse, um, in verse 5, and besides all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. And what are we supposed to add to our faith? Virtue. And what is virtue? It's moral excellence. And then we're supposed to add to virtue, he says, uh, if I can find it here, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. This is the knowledge of God. This is an intimate relationship with God. And to knowledge, temperance, that's self-control. And to temperance, patience, that's cheerful endurance. Being able to endure through trials cheerfully, without murmur, without complaining. And, uh, and to patience, godliness, that's a, a, a holy obedience, if you will. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And that word is used throughout the scriptures also as brotherly love. And having love toward the brethren and so forth. And having love of a brother. And it says unto brotherly kindness, charity. And that's what we've been talking about now, again, these last several weeks. We learn in verses 8 and beyond that uh, what happens if you do have these things in you and what happens if you don't have these things in you. And so uh, you and I can choose. We can either add these things to faith or we can choose not to add these things to faith. Now, I personally believe that this is given to us in a specific order for a specific reason. For instance, I do not think that you can truly have charity in your life if you do not have the other things also in your life. It's something that progresses that you add to, and, uh, and that's very important. So, as far as charity goes, the, the first week we spent time looking at the, the word agape, 
gapeo, agapetos, and, uh, and we've often said, and I've heard growing up in church all my life, that agape was, was God's love, okay, as opposed to some of the other phileo and, and, uh, and eros, and I think there's one other that I'm, I'm missing here, uh, Philadelphia, that would be brotherly love, and, uh, and so uh, agape was God's love, but what we did, we took time and looked at, every, not every time, but, but many a times, uh, the word agape is used in the Bible, and every time it's either referring to God's love specifically, or it's referring to you and I loving like God loves. And so we've taken time to actually see why we say it's God's love. And then last week we started just looking at the word charity itself, and I believe very strongly that God used the word charity on purpose, and so therefore we shouldn't just go around and changing it. I remember uh, a church that my, my family had attended, and the, uh, the church was very strong, King James Bible Church, but for whatever reason, the pastor during the Wednesday night Bible series, teaching through 1 Corinthians 13, when he had us read it responsibly with them, he told everyone to, to take the word charity and change it to the word love. And I was amazed how many people in the congregation were reading the word love, but my family and I, we read the word charity because that's what God chose it to be. And now there's a reason why the word charity is going to is used, and we're going to get to that more next week when we actually get to 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, but charity gives us this idea, it's not just uh, agape, that's God's love and us loving like God, but charity also adds to this concept of a love in action. And, uh, and so forth. And so we looked at the word charity last week, and I'll just go over what we learned without going into the scripture with you. Uh, but these are the things we learned about charity. We learned that charity edifies. Uh, charity lifts up. Uh, knowledge, the Bible says, it causes us to be puffed up with pride, but charity edifies. And so maybe you might know the truth, and that's fine, but having charity, that is something that's going to edify. You can teach the truth without being jerk about it, <laughs> okay? And so charity edifies. We also learn that uh, charity is the bond of perfectness. It's what binds, just like a sinew, just like a ligament that helps our body stay together. Charity is the bond of perfectness. And that word perfectness, we saw, dealt with the idea of maturity or completeness or, or, or you know, being, being all-encompassing. And so charity is the bond of perfectness. We also learn that charity can be seen. And I don't mean in the sense that you go in and you're, and you're showing off your giving in that respect, but uh, someone who has a heart of charity, someone who lives a charitable life. And again, I'm not necessarily referring to that of giving to charities and so forth. I'm talking about this love. Someone who has charity, it's, just, it's noticed. You can see it in them. And we saw that in several uh, passages. And then we learn that charity can grow. And, uh, and that our charity can abound more and more to the brethren. And then lastly, last week, we saw that charity forgives. And you'll notice when we get into 1 Corinthians 13 that a lot of this is going to be repeated in, in one respect. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 gives us the idea of, all right, this is how it ought to be. But all these verses we've looked at are, are living examples of it happening and seeing it happen. And so we learn that charity forgives. And so we're talking about charity, and we're going to move on to some new territory with that. And so take your Bibles, please, and to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 gives you a little bit of time to find it. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, now we looked at this Wednesday night uh, because we were studying uh, we're dealing with some church doctrine and so forth. And Wednesday night, we talked about or asked the question, well, what about women preachers? And, uh, and I mentioned to you Wednesday night that I wasn't going to park on verse 15 with you because I was going to be talking about it on, in Sunday school, but I gave you kind of an overview or an idea of uh, what was going on with that. But in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, we'll pick up at verse 9, the Bible says, In like manner... Also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered, broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So this idea of modesty, and I'm not going to talk about modest apparel with you. Uh, if you're interested in what the Bible says about modest apparel, we're doing a series. We've put on pause for a moment, but we're doing a series on body, soul, and spirit. And in that series, body, soul, and spirit, where we're talking about the body, we talked about the modest apparel and how we're supposed to cover our bodies and so forth. So if you're interested in that, I think it's on YouTube. Some of them I haven't caught up with, and I'll be posting on YouTube uh, as soon as I'm able to. But nonetheless, um, 
Part of modest repair is not just the covering of the skin, but also what we do with covering the skin. In other words, this is dealing with the idea of being uh, showy and uh, flashy and so forth. And, and so uh, the broidered hair, it's not saying that you can't do your hair, but this is talking about people that spend hours upon hours, if not an entire day, to have all kinds of inc intricate details and gold and so forth woven through the hair for the purpose of being seen and adored and so forth. And a godly woman, someone professing godliness, she's going to be more concerned about doing God's business than sitting in the salon for 10 hours, getting her hair, you know, looking perfect for three days or whatever the case may be. And uh, we're supposed to be showing... Uh, uh, showing forth the the beauty of the inner man more so than the beauty of the outer man, and so uh, and this costly array. Uh, you can look nice, you can dress nice, but you don't need to spend a thousand dollars on a dress, you know, uh, or even a hundred. Well, I don't know. Dresses are kind of expensive, so you know. But but you get my point. And uh, now, but what's interesting to me is the word costly here in this passage is also found in Second Peter. I think it is uh, chapter three. Am I right? Let's see here, maybe it's 1 Peter. Let me look at 1 Peter real quick. 1 Peter, it's probably in my notes because I think I'm going to be talking about this. Yes, in 1 Peter chapter 3, when it talks about wives, and, uh, and it says in verse 4, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a of great price. And that word great price, the Greek word, is the same word that's costly in our Timothy passage here, uh, where they're told not to put on costly ray. And I'd like to say to you ladies that God holds you in a very high value. The Bible says in Proverbs 31 about a virtuous woman far above rubies and the statement is made, who can find her? In other words, she's so rare. Okay, she's so rare, and God holds a virtuous woman in a very in a place of high uh, high value and so forth. And as he said, he says that this woman that's virtuous, this woman that that has that meek and quiet spirit, this woman that is godly in that respect, he says that he's a she's of great price, which is the same idea or the same word that's used to talk about this costly array. So don't be so concerned about having costly array. Rather, be concerned about being a woman of great price. And uh, and so that's what's going on here. This does tie in with what I'm about to say. Uh, but verse 10 it says, we're back in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 10 it says, uh, regarding the, the women, rather than doing all this stuff, but, and then you have a parenthetical statement, which becometh women professing godliness. In other words, ladies, if you're going to profess godliness, this becomes you. This, this is how you ought to behave, he says. And uh, so, uh, instead of having the broidered hair and the gold or pearls or costly array, he says, but with good works. You're supposed to adorn yourself with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Now, this is what we talked about Wednesday night. This is not referring to the fact that, you know, keep quiet and keep in the kitchen kind of thing. Um, but this is dealing with the idea, as we're going to see in the context, is dealing mainly with the concept of church and preaching and teaching and usurping authority over the man. It follows into the next chapter 3 uh, where it talks about the office of a bishop being a man, the husband of one wife, and having his house in order and so forth. And if you're curious about that, you can watch last Wednesday night's uh, uh, video and, and I'll try to remember to put a link when I post this on YouTube and so forth. But nonetheless... He says, uh, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. And that word silence simply means when the preacher's preaching, just like anyone else should, be quiet and listen to what the preacher's saying. Okay? And uh, so let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer, I don't allow, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Okay? So no, women pastors are not biblical. If you are going to a church that has a woman pastor, she is in rebellion against God and his plan and his ordination, uh, his, his order of things. And, uh, and if you're reading books written by women pastors, that woman is in rebellion to God's plan for her life. And therefore, you're not... Well, well, you're wrong, okay? Uh, simple as that, okay? Uh, don't teach or usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. You can't do that in pastor at the same time. Just saying. Now, verse 13. Why? For Adam was first formed in Eve. God made man first for a reason, okay? Because man is supposed to lead. If you don't like that, take it up with God. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. We talked about this Wednesday night as well. I think one reason why this is put in place, Adam knew what he was doing. He wasn't tricked. 
But Eve was tricked. And then Eve, after being tricked and eating of the fruit, she took it to Adam, or she had it for Adam, and she, I don't know how, I, I don't know, did she seduce him to eating it? Why did Adam eat the fruit? Well, he ate the fruit because his wife gave it to him. And so I believe a truth here is that Satan didn't attack Adam. If Satan had gone to Adam and said, hey, Adam, eat this fruit, it's going to make you wise, Adam would have said, shut up, Satan, I know all about this fruit. You're not, going to, you're not going to trick me. I'm not doing that. So he went to Eve. And Eve was beguiled. You can't, you can't argue that. Eve was beguiled, and the way to get to Adam was to get through Eve. But Eve was beguiled, and this is one reason why God has put the man to be in leadership over the church and uh, in the home and so on and so forth. That does not mean, this is Mother's Day lady. Uh, ladies, that does not mean you're second class. It does not mean that you're of lesser value. In fact, you're of greater value if you just fulfill the role that God gave you. And you're going to see that in a moment. All right. Verse 14. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Verse 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. Now, there's some, uh, I don't even want to call them denominations, but there's some uh, cults out there, like the Mormon church, uh, who teach that, uh, of course, at one time they taught that, you know, a man could have multiple wives, and I think they're called sister wives, and, and then when, if the man lives holy enough, and if he gets buried in his holy underwear and so forth, and he has on that little thing covering his groin area, uh, that he'll get his own planet. And uh, that he'll be the God of one day. And uh, because the Bible says, you will be God, you know. And, uh, and so he'll get his own plan in. All the wives that he had on earth, if he liked them, he'll take them to his heaven with him. And they will be eternally pregnant. And, uh, and they will populate the earth. That's what, ha that's what happened to Jesus, you know. Satan is his brother. And Jesus. This is what they teach, okay. And uh, so next time you listen to the Latter-day Saints, you might want to think about that. Uh, but nonetheless... Uh, one of the things I believe that they also teach is that one way that the wife can be saved is if she gives birth. And if she doesn't give birth, then her husband's not going to take her to heaven when it's time to go. And, uh, and uh, a, a damnable doctrine, certainly it is. Right. Uh, this isn't talking about salvation in that respect. Uh, in fact, let me tell you the, the, the point that I'm getting at here is regarding charity. Charity. What does charity do? Well, we saw several things that charity does. One of them is charity protects. It protects. In other words, if you live a life of charity, it will protect you. And you're going to see that in the next passage in a moment. But let me finish talking about this one. It says, she shall be saved in childbearing. What is this talking about? She shall be saved uh, is dealing with the idea of, uh, okay... We live in a society, and we live in a world, technically, ever since the Garden of Eden, and, and, and Eve was attacked, and she uh, took of the fruit, and then she, uh, she gave it to Adam, and Adam ate the fruit, and, and ever since then, you don't have to look very hard in history to find this to be true, uh, but women have been under attack. The idea of ladyhood has been under attack. We're living in a day and age where our gender roles, and I do believe that God gave us gender roles, have been so crisscrossed uh, that women are trying to be like men and men are trying to be like women, not just in the way they act, but the way they dress and everything else. And, uh, and, and ladies have left the highest state that God has given them. And, uh, and I believe what's going on here is basically Paul, or uh, yes, Paul is telling Timothy here uh, that, uh, that if, if, if a woman would just fit the role that she was given, she'll be saved from herself in that respect. In other words, a common explanation is that it is to be taken in its generic sense as referring to all Christian mothers who will be saved in fulfilling their proper destiny and acquiescing in all the conditions of a Christian woman's life. Instead of attempting to take an active part as teachers or other public religious assemblies, they are to be in subjection to their own husbands and to be keepers of the home, and in doing so, and in following the role that God has given them, they will save themselves from themselves, because once they try to usurp authority and take a position that is not theirs, instead of finding the hope and the joy that what they thought would be fulfilling for them, they find that they're empty. And so she'll be saved in childbearing. It's not saying that if you've not had children, if you can't have children, that you're hopeless. The point is, the general concept is, 
that uh, by, by continuing in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety, basically the concept is, ladies, if you just continue doing what God has created you to do, childbearing is certainly a part of that. If you're not even have children, that's an exception to the rule. But certainly childbearing is a part of that. No man can have a child. You know, you find me a man that has a baby. I'll, I'll show you someone that, uh, you know, might just uh, make some money, you know, and be a lab rat the rest of his life. You know, but, but women were designed to birth children. In fact, it's interesting. Well, I'm not going to get into it. Uh, so nonetheless... Uh, the, the, the idea of childbearing and it says if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety, what's going to happen? They're going to save themselves. Not talking about, again, going to heaven when you die, but uh, the truth is they're going to save themselves from themselves. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, in fact, if you're in, uh, take your Bibles and turn to Titus. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And uh, we'll pick it up at verse 1. That made an interesting sound. <laughs> Titus chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now we're going to be looking at this verse in a little bit uh, later on. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity, and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You see, the e Room Adam movement, the ERA, and so forth, and all this, uh, this feminism so, and whatnot, has ruined feminism, has ruined true femininity. And, uh, and here the Bible clearly teaches that the women, uh, we saw what the men are supposed to do, but I'm looking at women right now. The aged women, what do they do? They, 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 they live in a behavior that becometh holiness. And they're not supposed to be false accusers, and they're not supposed to be giving them much wine, and they're supposed to be teacher of good things. And what are they supposed to teach? Young women. So now we're talking about young women, too. The aged women are supposed to teach young women. What do they teach women, young women to do? To be sober, to, be, to have control, uh, if you will, to love their husbands, to love their husbands, and some of them are very unlovely, uh, to love their children. <clears throat> and that's a hard one. Uh, to be discreet, to be chaste. Uh, to be keepers at home, that's certainly something we lost in our society. And I'll just go ahead and say this. Boy, I tell you what, I'm going to dig a hole today. And, uh, but here's the thing. Uh, you do what you want. You do what you want. You run your house the way you want to run your house. I'm not trying to tell you how to live your life in that respect. But don't give me this thing of, well, in this society, there's just no way for a, for, for, for a stay-at-home wife and a, and a mother to, to be at home taking her children. We need to have two jobs so we can take care of everything and send our kids off to someone else so they can teach our kids. And, and doc, the reason why we're in such a mess is because women have stopped doing their job and we have children being indoctrinated in the damnable public school right. system. We don't even know our own history. We've kicked God out of society. Why? Because women left the place that God gave and went to the workforce and tried to become a man instead of just doing what God gave them to do. Now, you can like a lump and jump in a bump, but I'm not trying to be mean, and I wasn't meaning to preach today. Uh, I wasn't meaning to even go over this stuff, but you know, it really, it really tans my hide when I hear people say, well, you just don't understand. We, we've got to pay these. Listen, my wife has been a keeper of home. You know, when we first got married, she was a Christian school teacher, and then we moved. When we moved, she, we didn't even have children yet, and I worked to make sure that she was provided for, and to make sure that I could pay my college bill, and then we had that bad accident, and as a result, I injured my back, and I lost my job, and then I ended up getting another job that didn't pay near as much as the job that I lost, and so my wife went to work at the same company. We didn't have children yet, and so she was working to help and pay bills and so forth, but eventually she wasn't able to do that anymore, and so she stayed home, I continued working, we had children, I did what I had to do, I was a man that did what a man had to do, and I found work that did not contradict the scriptures, that allowed me to be in church, just like I was supposed to be in church, and yet take care of my family, but you know what, 
We did without. We might have eaten Roman, no Roman Raymond noodles, is that what it's called? We might have eaten Raymond noodles. We might not have had steak. We might not have had great, wonderful date nights. Our date night half the time was uh, there was another college family that had a bunch of kids, and uh, and we would uh, uh, we would go over to their house and watch their kids and do our laundry at their house so they could go on a date, and that was a date for us, you know, and uh, because they had Nintendo 64, and we had to play that with their kids, you know, Donkey Kong and all that kind yeah, of stuff, you know, that was our date night, but, uh, but, but we just, we sacrificed so that we could raise a family without having to send them off some godless people to tell them about, uh, about, 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 how, about the world and so forth. I'm just saying, you don't have to, to go against the word of God and I don't know how else to put this more plainly. Uh, this is what the Bible says. Now listen, folks, I love you. If you choose to have a husband and wife working outside of the home, that's your business. I don't care. But you've got children at home. I'm just telling you the reason why our society is so messed up is because we've gotten out of, we've gotten out of God's plan. We've gotten out of God's order. And I'm just saying, if you really wanted it, if you really wanted it, you could do it. To this day, I don't make a lot of money. God knows I don't make a lot of money. But I believe God, and I trust God, and I live by Amen. faith, and I do what I've got to do to make sure that my family is taken care of. Amen. And my wife is able to be a keeper of the home. We're able to homeschool our children. We're able to raise children. For the most part, I'm very happy with my children. And I say that for the most part. You understand we all have problems, but they have me. So, uh, But, but uh, I'm very grateful for my children. I'm not saying that they're always perfect and that they're the role models of society, but I'm telling you, they're doing a whole lot better than some of those kids that have been raised a godless society. Right. And so, <laughs> happy Mother's Day. <laughs> but this is what the Bible says. Follow it or don't follow it. The reason why you're so miserable is because you've chosen not to follow the Bible. You've chosen to follow the world. Right. Aged women, what are they supposed to do? Teach young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers of home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Did you hear that? That the word of God be not blasphemed. And in our, I, I don't have it in my notes, but I already mentioned it, so I might as well go there again. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, it's, in verse 1, it says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. You understand, ladies, how much a, a power you have? You understand how much control you truly do have if you stop trying to take control? How much power you have if you stop trying to take power? How much uh, influence you have if you stop trying to be so influential? If you just do what God told you to do, you'd be amazed what would happen. He says, uh, regarding these husbands, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, verse 3, talking about the wives whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plating the hair or wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. God, give us a meek and quiet spirited ladies again. Amen. Meek and quiet spirit. Let's stop trying to be a man. Okay, men are designed a certain way and women are designed a certain way. And, uh, and I think men ought to be gentlemen. I think men ought to be uh, gracious and so forth. I don't think they ought to be using foul language and all that stuff. But, I, uh, but, but, but to, to see ladies trying to, to imitate that is just beyond me. Anyway, he's a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. God holds you at a great price. But you taint yourself. And so, in our Timothy passage, if you go back there again, Timothy chapter 2, it says that uh, she shall be saved, notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. There is another take on this. And now on the other hand, the woman Eve may be regarded as including all Christian mothers. Notice that it goes from if she, uh, let me rephrase this, it goes from the singular to the plural, notwithstanding she, Eve, she shall be saved, saved in childbearing if they, the women to follow, continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. So what does that mean? Well, it very likely could mean this. Uh, she, though she fell into transgression, shall be saved by the childbearing, that is, by the relation in which the woman stood to the Messiah. She, Eve, shall be saved if they, the women to follow her, continue to have children, eventually producing the Messiah. 
And uh, that's certainly an outtake that we could get from that. But uh, this we do know. It was intended that women do not usurp authority over the man in the church, but rather they continue from Eve to the present, being godly mothers, living in faith, charity, and holiness, all of which while ma maintaining self-control. And so you say, well, preach, what does this do with charity protecting? I'm saying that if she lived in charity, following everything we just discussed, she won't find herself in a position that Eve found herself when she ate the fruit. All right, let's look at another one dealing with this charity protects. Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two. Uh, or, that's where we are, isn't it? All right. So now jump down to verse nineteen. <clears throat> it says, "Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal: the Lord knoweth them that are His." Amen for that. And that every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. This is 2 Timothy 2.19. I think I've lost somebody in the auditorium. All right. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use. Prepared unto every good work. Then it says in verse 22, flee also youthful lusts. Okay? So these are things. You're supposed to purge yourself from these, uh, uh, this, the, these uh, dishonorable vessels and so forth. You're supposed to purge yourself. You're supposed to uh, flee also youthful lusts. Notice what it says, but follow. So instead of the youthful lusts, you're fleeing from that, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, uh, but then that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So there's, there's a few things listed, but we're focusing on charity today. And so rather than following or going after youthful lust, we're told flee youthful lust and follow after. And one of the things we follow after is charity. And so listen, uh, it's not enough to stop doing something. You need to replace what you're doing with something else. And so instead of following after your youthful lust, what you need to do is follow after charity, which is God's love or loving like God loves. And then it says in verse 23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender stripes, or they birth or give way to stripes, and so forth. And so rather than uh, getting involved in foolish and unlearned questions and debates and so forth, what we ought to be doing is following after righteousness, faith, and charity. And so in that respect, I believe charity will help protect us. If we add charity to these things that we add to our faith, if we truly live a life where we have the love of God and we, we exercise the love of God towards others, that in and of itself, listen, you can't harm your neighbor if you're living with the love of God. Does that make sense? In fact, the Bible tells us, I think I referenced this last week, the Bible tells us uh, every time Every time in the New Testament scriptures where the phrase is quoting Leviticus, but every time the New Testament scripture phrase says, uh, 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 the greatest commandment of these is to love thy neighbor as thy, uh, is love God with all your heart, and then it says, and to love thy neighbor as thyself. And he says, if you do this, you fulfill all the law. Okay? With well, the word love there is the word agape. And so if we have that charity, that godly love towards others, and not just the brethren, but, but our neighbors, those who we come in contact with as ourselves, the Bible says in doing so, we fulfill the law. What does that mean? Now, under the law, what that meant was, and, and you and I are not under the law, but the illustration still holds true, that if you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to covet their life. If you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to kill them, okay? If you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to do these things. And so by you and I practicing and living and adding charity to our life, it will protect us, if nothing else, from ourselves and doing things that we ought not to do. Amen. All right. So let's look at the next one. We already looked at this verse for a different reason, but take your Bibles and go back to, sec uh, to Titus again. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. So today, so far, we've learned that charity protects, and now we're going to learn that char charity is part of sound doctrine. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, in verse 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, and then there's a colon. And then he's going to tell us what these things are. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience, and of course it goes on to everything that we read before. I just want you to notice again that the word charity is part of the list. It's not the only thing, but it's part of it. And so that's why I say charity is part of sound doc doctrine. He says, you, he says to Titus, and Titus, listen, left you there in Crete, uh, so you can set in order the things that are wanting and so forth. But uh, he says, I want you to speak things that become sound doctrine. Become, again, doesn't mean it turns into, it deals with this idea of becometh. Or it's, it's, it's appropriate for, okay? 
And, uh, and so things which become sound doctrine, and one of those things is charity. Now the word sound means entire, unbroken, not shaky, split, or defective. Uh, it means undecayed, it means whole, it means perfect, it means unbroken, not bruised, not destroyed, uh, whole or entire, healthy, not diseased, founded in truth, firm, strong, valid, solid, uh, right, correct, well founded, free from error, uh, founded in the right of law, legal, valid, not defective, that cannot be overthrown, fast, profound, undisturbed, as sound sleep. Perfect as intellect, uh, not broken or defective. So he says here the things that become sound, or the things that become sound doctrine, uh, uh, something that you can stand on, something that's not going to decay, something that's not going to fade away. And part of that, part of that list that we're given is this word charity. Let me say this to you: you might you might know your Bible backwards and forwards. You might know to quote from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of Revelation. You might know all the doctrines we had to cross all the T's and dot all the I's, and you might have all understanding of all these things. Just as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, he might know all things, but if he doesn't have charity, what happens? The prophet is in the middle, right? And so you might, you might know the truth, but brother, if you're not practicing charity amongst these other things, but if you're not practicing charity, you do not have sound doctrine. I don't care how right you are. Do you realize that you can be right with a uh, with a with in, you can be correct with an incorrect spirit? And so we need to make sure. And this is true. You know the circles that I've come from. I tell you what, uh, we have this idea that you know. It, it, in, in the fundamentalist ranks and whatnot, uh, the IFB movement, I tell you, just, you know, they're not happy unless they're finding someone else that they can attack, you know? Uh, you get the average IFB paper, you're going to see someone's being attacked somewhere along the line, you know? That may not be 100% true anymore, but it certainly was at one time. And, uh, and I get it. I, don't, I, I understand standing for truth. We're supposed to be uh, contending for the faith, but it doesn't mean we're supposed to be contentious, right? And so I understand that we're supposed to fight for, what's, uh, for the truth and we're supposed to stand for doctrine. I get that. Uh, and, and I don't mind. I did a little bit of name calling on Wednesday, talking about, you know, uh, some of the, the female preachers and so forth. I just saw uh, a video where Joel Olstein was being interviewed and someone asked him, you know, what do you think about the Pope? Oh, the Pope, he's a great man. I tell you what, he is so wonderful. I, and, uh, and we've got so much in common. And, you know, we ought, to, we ought to just include everybody. And the person said, so does that include homosexuals? Of course it does, you know. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and whatnot. And, I, and I'll tell you, Joel Osteen is a false prophet. I don't mind saying that, okay? Uh, if I saw Joel Osteen on the street today, guess what? I'm not going to spit in his face, okay? Uh, I, I'm not going to call him names. I'm not going to go up and, and, and it's, it's probably just the, the water system. Uh, I'm not going to go up and punch him or something like that, okay? Uh, and and if, if he actually would listen to me, not sure that he would. If I could, if I could reach him with the word of God, I would try. But I don't think that he's even saved. I think he's just a charlatan. I think he's just uh, in it for the money and so forth and, and uh, whatnot. And he's a pied piper leading a whole bunch of people astray. But that's beside the point. I don't mind saying that. I don't mind telling the truth about it. But it doesn't mean I have to be mean to him on a personal level. Am I making sense there? This is not a personal attack. I'm talking about doctrine. But you understand, folks, that sometimes we can be very mean spirit when we're trying to be heavenly spirit and it just doesn't match, okay? Part of sound doctrine is having charity. Okay, I'll give you the last one and then we're done. Uh, Jude, Jude, Jude. <laughs> Go to Jude. I almost told you Jude chapter 1, but, you know, I was afraid you might try to go to Jude chapter 2. But Jude, in verse 11, the Bible says, Woe unto them! Exclamation point. Just pointing out it's okay to preach. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Corinth. These are spots in your feast of charity, uh, which they feast with, uh, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees uh, whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And so Jude, he's already preaching up a storm. Amen. And, uh, and so again, preaching up a storm is not the same thing as not having charity, and I think that's obvious. But here's the thing. He says these individuals, uh, these false teachers, these false prophets, these, these false preachers and so forth, he says there's spots in your feast of charity. What am I saying here? I'm saying that charity can be tarnished. It can be tarnished, okay? 
And uh, these folks, they were spots in their feast of charity. They, they tarnished their feast of charity. And so we just need to be careful in that respect. All right, so let me give you a quick review. And uh, uh, what we found out about charity next week, we'll get into 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And then we probably will be done with the series, as far as I can tell. Uh, but charity edifies. Charity is the bond of perfectness. Charity can be seen. It's noticeable. Charity can grow. Charity forgives. Charity protects. Uh, charity <clears throat> is part of sound doctrine. And charity can be tarnished. And so uh, you can just consider some of these things. And uh, let's see here. It is 1045. So we've got about 15 minutes before the next service. God bless you.